All right. So we have fewer students than usual today. I don't know where you all are. Um, I hope you're all okay. That I assume you know that something happened, right? You're sick, you're distracted, you're overwhelmed, something. So I, I'm thinking about you. I hope you can, you know, get through it, move on. Um, so in this course, we have three more classes before final week. And then we meet Wednesday morning of final week to present both your research paper and the outline of your final paper. Okay, so the last three classes are chapters from the same book. It's a book I wrote. Um, but what it does is it takes um, recent discoveries in neuroscience and suggests that actually the Enlightenment got it wrong. And uh, what we're finding out about the human psyche is um, totally different. The psyche has to be based on what Damasio calls feelings, okay? And my claim is that this is a lot more like what Aristotle said than you are aware of, Mr. Damasio because the educational systems now are very specialized. Um, so I'll sort of try to run through it and see if you can, you know, have some aha moments. And also when you're writing your posts or your papers. So those of you who wrote your papers, especially when you wrote a letter to yourself, you're literally doing what Mr. Damasio said. Oh, we've just found out that's a really healthy way to live your life. Okay. All right, Mr. Damasio, whatever. Um, so I want to point that out to you that um, you're cutting edge, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing by living an examined life. Um, you really shouldn't be too hard on yourself, right? The goal is to um, figure out how to, how to link what's in your head with what's out there in the universe. But it's a long, hard story. And many of you, because you live in the countries you live in, or you live in the particular places in those countries, or because you're a woman, or because maybe of your ethnicity, there's more of a gap between what you have gotten exposed to as a child, either at home or in your society or at school or whatever, and what's actually the case, right? So you have to Try to match your psyche, reform your psyche, develop different neural maps. <laughs> you have to break some of those neural maps you grew up with and form new ones. But the way to do that is you get a different idea in your head. And then you can take that idea and, and um, teach yourself how to have different emotions, but mostly different feelings, okay? So emotions are what come from the outside world. We, and that's fear, right? Something out there is threatening and we have an emotion which is immediate. But right away that gets digested. You Right away you start thinking, I, I'm afraid instantly when you do that all of a sudden your brain has kicked in but that turns emotions into feelings and then feelings can be examined and re-examined and re-examined so you teach yourself to have healthy emotions and link that with ideas and and um 
that's his idea. He has a philosophical idea of salvation, the intellectual love of God, but he also affirms uh, institutionalized religion. So um, I am giving you in this class, I'm giving you uh, completely open opportunities to decide you're a humanist, you can be an atheist, an agnostic, anything you want to be. And there are neuroscientists who will support you, systems thinking people who will support you. Um, so you can feel comfortable just free associating and figuring out what sort of a map, what sort of a neural map you want to make for yourself. Um, but I will try to go through this step by step. And I will start out just by asking each of you if you had something you wanted to say at the beginning of the class. So, um, Amal, did you tell me you didn't? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I read. Um, I skimmed some. Okay. Yeah. And follow. Uh, okay. Now, by the end of the class, though, everybody should have some reaction. And Falak was didn't get around to it. What about now? Did you read it? Yes, Professor. I read just only chapter one, and then I, uh, yeah, I like this reading, and then I agree with you that, like, uh, great, uh, follow the great philosophy is um, like better than the other. We can see because it, it uh, they are the one who, like, yeah, how to say, uh, educate the human soul. So if we compare to the other philosophical, uh, uh, like other like Aristotle or other uh, philosophy, because it's like uh, more interesting for me, and they I care a lot his view more than the other one. Yeah. Okay. But you basically, I made up the expression spiritual humanism. So I, I would love it if each of you made up. You know, this is my theory, <laughs> or. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The other thing you can do, and actually I'll talk about that in a uh, later on, um, another idea for your final. Um, Rita, did you get around to reading it? Sorry, Professor, I didn't. Okay, so just remember, I will um, ask everyone to have some reaction to the class too. Um, and I, I do think that probably helps the students who didn't make it to class if they could just have some idea of how the other students reacted. So um, I, I hope you know, you'll, you'll eventually have a reaction. What about Ashlyn? Uh, prof professor, I couldn't complete reading it today. I was caught up because of my family things. I, I, I hope to, I hope to um, have my reaction towards the end. OK, okay. good. Um, there she is. Somebody cut your bangs. Uh, <laughs> okay, Diana, did you have one? Okay. Um, Fatima. Are you there? Mosa? Professor, I couldn't go through the readings. I apologize. Okay, Jana Tool? Is she there? Okay, Aurora? Yes, Professor, I read chapter one and chapter two. Did you have a reaction? Uh, yes, yeah, I have reactions. Okay, Professor. So I think the article is based on neuroscience and ancient Greek philosophy and culture. Uh, the first chapter of the article uh, features a 
brief description of what, uh, what the rest of the chapters are related to. Uh, when the author's uh, philosophy professor introduced her to Greek philosophy, she begins to get an idea of Greek philosophy and eventually dedicates herself to Greek philosophy. According to the author, all aspects of Greek culture are designed in a way that the human soul has to, has to try and educate in such a way what is has to activate the mind with all its might. Self-conscious thinking and all aspects of human nature, history, and science are created by the power of human thought. All the text of Greek pedia, a poems, a tragedy, and Plato's dialogues have the same goal. The Greek felt it was their responsible to build their heritage uninterruptedly. One of the reasons why the author writes about the Greek is remembered to Greek culture. And the second chapter of the book describes Damasio's approach. Human feelings need the experience to survive, which is explained by Damasio. Damasio describes the process of creating a natural neural map. The body, brain, and mind are the manifestations of a single organism. They are effectively inseparable under normal operating conditions. Uh, Damasio made a clear distinction between emotion, which he called natural knowledge. He further explained that the phenomena of the body are presented as concept of the mind. When we as conscious human beings face every new moment in life, we endure our past in joys and sorrows at that moment in the imaginary situation of our expected future. Damasio was a new recognition and appreciation for uh, psychology. And uh, also uh, modern biology has relieved that nature is in fact more cruel and indifferent than I think. Yeah, Professor, that's what I got. Thank you. So Aurora wins the prize for spending the most hours in this class so far because she tells me how long she spends on every post. So let's do a shout out, okay? Thanks a lot, Professor. Okay, very good. Um, Pooja, did you come up with something? Hello, Professor. Yes, Professor. So, uh, uh, after reading the first chapter, I uh, want to connect that source of chapter with my um, own life. So, what I came to realize is that the role of uh, this neuroscience with the traditional local healers, for example, my dad, my grandpa is a local healer, and the patients uh, comes every single day to meet him. So when he uh, he treats every single uh, kind of uh, problems or a mental disorders, uh, simple mental disorders for the patients. So he don't use any uh, like uh, I mean medicinal horrible medicine for treatment, but he used uh, as a form of uh, example, doctors use their instrument, right? So in, instead of instrument, my, uh, my grandpa used, uh, for example, to treat the uh, sickness, he used uh, rice and broom, also water and then acid. So I was, when I was reading your paper, I was trying to connect it with the Mm, like the with the role of local traditional local he, healer in our country so basically we have a lot of uh super stitious belief regarding this that uh, when we go to eat uh, with local healer so 
they will treat it very easily in comparison to the medical doctors and many people like i have done a research in the um, last semester and there are more than 40 percent of people in the rural area who believes that local healers are uh, i mean like very effective in comparisons to medical doctors in treating the uh, mental sickness so I was much curious into looking that, uh, but like the Greek uh, uh, culture and Western culture and the form of treatment over there was quite different in the paper, but like I tried to connect it with the uh, with my own life because I have to see it every single day and people really believe on it. Thank you, Professor. Sure, Pooja. Well, that's fascinating. So we can, we can think about that. I mean, the Greeks combined um, curing your soul and curing your body together. Um, and so when I talk about Mr. Damasio, he starts out thinking, you know, you really have to focus on your ideas and your thoughts. And then by the end of the book, he says, we're going to have a pill to cure addiction, violence. It's like, you just said you can't do that. Does it, did that cross anybody's mind? He's saying you can give a pill and you don't have to fix their thoughts. Um, so yeah, Pooja, um, I think it will be fun to compare what your grandpa does because what I'm thinking is just the fact that they trust your grandpa and he has an image in their mind of be, being the healer, that their thoughts, right? They're not as anxious and their thoughts calm down and, and that itself sort of helps their body chemistry. Do you think that's true, Pooja? Uh, professor, since I don't know, like he, uh, he has like four, uh, sons and three daughters and they keep uh, believing on that and they grew up in the society in the in home that and sometimes I really don't feel like okay this shouldn't be true but like it's all about like our way of thinking when we think like okay if he is gonna treat our uh, sickness he we are gonna go and find because so painful my grandpa cries sometimes because of the pain he thinks he turns us like he take all the pains of the patients and that's why he is crying he is 90 years of old and doing something for others at this age of time very difficult and sometimes he literally cry out of tears and he, we feel so bad when he works for like other people and we need to believe sometimes, but like I'm in confusion between two things, like really this happens or when I see the patients, a baby cries at midnight and people take uh, that baby in the midnight and grandpa does something and he is happy, happy now. I mean, like really does it happens when he treats people, gets so people find it so relief. And then it, this really makes me thinking like, and that's why I did a um, course with Tiffany last semester. And we had a whole class discussing about the local healer and form of treatment. And I wrote my final paper on that as well. And we had a whole class lecture on my grandpa's uh, forms of uh, traditional uh, treatments and everything. And it was really fun, Professor. What did she say? Did she talk about the relationship between? Yeah science and yeah i mean yeah science and traditional form of uh treatment so what happened is like, i was just randomly uh calling i was just randomly talking about the local healer because we had to watch six or seven um videos uh, from the Asia and the form of treatments in there. And then I suddenly told like my, my grandpa is similar to that. Uh, he does everything similar to that. He uses the uh, uh, forms of treatment similar to that, but quite different. But like, and uh, she got so fascinated about that. And like, 
we started talking about it and she wanted to have a whole lecture on our grandpa. So basically I asked my grandpa and then he was translating, he was uh, telling all the stories from the beginning to till now. And I was translating into the English and uh, whole classes were listening and professor told like, you should write a whole paper of yours uh, in this topic. And then I did that. I took the interview of my grandpa again and we did a ethnographic study. Right. But the, the next question is, does it actually heal, right? In other words, do you need also modern medicine to supplement that or are yes, the professor, I guess. So it would actually be best if you could have both? Mm -mm. Yeah. But yeah. like many times, uh, like for example, if for example, if my uh, body is paining and then my mom says, go and uh, ask your grandpa is something bad is happening in your body. And if he like, for example, do his mantras, and gives a glass of water to that and says like puja drink it and if i drink it it makes me think that okay he did it some mantras and now i will feel better and then it feels better i don't know it's all about how you think okay like, I, I mean there's <laughs> right so uh, you know it's really yeah, exactly. right it's so interesting to see what is the relationship right between the mind and the body and um Mr. Damasio is focusing on feelings, right? So if your mother told you to go to your grandpa, but you didn't want to, and you didn't think he could do anything for you, right? He probably couldn't. Does that make sense, Pooja? Yes, Professor. Then I thought about it. Then I normally say my mom is like, it doesn't work mom let's go and have medicine like first try i mean first try from your grandpa if it doesn't happen we'll go to doctor and then it works like that first we need to try some local uh, traditional medicines at home and then my mom says like next step is going to doctor first you should treat local locally i mean like in a traditional way in our home it's a work like this professor <laughs> okay so Here's, here's what happens all around the world, is that some people, it's not just a local doctor, it's, it's the local um, preacher, imam, and some people um, think if you pray, right, if you pray to God, people in the U.S. do this, that God will heal you or it's your time to go, right? And that's really anti-science. So that's, religion can make you fatalistic, right? You don't, you don't do science, you just, whatever's meant to be, that's fatalism. And, and then the next step would be that there are local, remedies, right? Medicines and therapies that have been shown over a long time to actually work. And so contemporary modern medicine should pay attention to some of that local stuff. They shouldn't just assume that what they have is better. And then there's the problem of if people won't go to the modern scientists or if they're intimidated and they they're psychologically uh, afraid. They don't believe it. I mean, but if they go to the local person and they trust them and mentally they're in a better place, right? Then the, the actual medicine might work better. So the other side of it is that religion can give people resilience so they aren't as afraid and so they can keep going. So there's just a whole lot of layers of stuff. I don't, it's just a lot more complicated than that's before science and now science is going to save us. Um, is that what uh, Dr. Cohn said? 
what was her sort of take on it? Pooja? Well, I guess others were in the class. Was it just that she was interested or was it, did she, you know, make some distinctions about how modern science interacts with ancient science, actually healing? Question, could you please repeat it? Yeah, were you in the class, Ashlyn? Yeah. I was not with Pooja. I took it like two semesters back, I guess. Okay, so is the general view of the anthropologists that some of the stuff actually is the result of a lot of empiricism, you know? It's centuries of testing on people. And so there's reasons to pay attention to some of it. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I just don't know. I, I know some people think it should modern medicine should replace all that 100%, right? But I think someone like an anthropologist, there's indigenous knowledge that some of that stuff really has a scientific base, but they don't, they didn't have all the science language and machines and all that sort of stuff. They just figured it out through experience, right? Professor, so what I found is, I, I, I don't know whether I'm answering to your question correctly, but uh, I, when I have taken the course, we also watched like uh, six to some seven movies, like based on the traditional healing um, in Indonesia and everything. So what we have concluded is that uh, like the, the characters in that movie, they were, uh, they were taken both to the traditional healing and the modern medicine. So the change that is found uh, is when they were taken to the modern medicine, like whenever they were taken to the traditional healers, it, it didn't necessarily give any changes to them. So I guess that, that, a whole idea of showing us the film, uh, what I got is uh, to understand the importance of the modern medicine in that context. Like when they were getting this modern, uh, modern medicine and when they were introduced to it, they were having a lot of changes. But when they were in the traditional healing things, it's, it's just all these mantras as Pooja told and kind of some oils. And I, I, I didn't understand what they were going through. So it, it like, it, it had uh, side effects like they were having a lot of pain again when they were uh, given this traditional healing techniques. But when it comes to the modern medicine, it was all, you know, from a scientific a science point of view and they were having changes. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, that whole idea of showing us the film is to introduce us to the importance of the modern techniques ra rather than the traditional healing thing, Professor. That's okay. what I got. Okay, That's, that works. I just, um, again, I like to, I don't like to assume anything, uh, but Mr. Uh, Damasio is saying that some of that modern stuff had a false, has a false foundation, right? Um, some psychology, for example, behavior modification. You can't just have external rewards and punishments and think that you can control behavior because people think, right? You can trigger emotions, but they will get turned into your thoughts, will turn them into feelings and more thoughts and more thoughts. And it's their thoughts that's actually gonna govern them over time, not the rewards and punishments, behavior modification. So he has rejected that. But that traditional healing wasn't based on that anyway, right? And then the dualism is you split mind and body completely and traditional medicine isn't based on that either. So, so I guess my point is that I try to make it as complex as I can without just saying something that's we has been proven to be false, right? Um, so doctors do have to gain the trust of patients and they can get better faster. Um, people have to 
have some sort of belief in in them <laughs> and then that will help the healing process it's not it you can't the body can't heal itself without the mind and the and the feelings and the emotions they all need to work together but um but that is interesting um, anybody else want to comment so far? It's we've gotten way off topic, but um, okay. So what what I was getting at is Mr. Damasio is responding to the material that we've read in this class, right? So this is sort of the culmination of the class. Um, let me. Uh, Get my outline here, okay. So ever since we read Seneca, um, there was this model of the microcosm in the macrocosm. And that was presented as an ancient point of view. And Seneca asked his friend, right, to examine himself, to figure out if he should have a private life or a public life to um, not to love self-control, don't be jealous of other people for their wealth. Don't be conflicted, right? So you can literally structure your mind to fit the world. And um, so that I presented that as the ancient view. And now Mr. Damasio is presenting it as the result of contemporary neuroscience. Did people understand that much? That, did that make sense when you were reading it? Aurora? Yes, Professor. Okay, so I, I wanted to get you on that page. And then he said, we should have new models of how to combine the sciences and the humanities. So you can think about your own education at AUW. How does it combine the sciences, the social sciences, the humanities, and the arts? Do the teachers combine it, or do, are you just given each discipline and you have to figure out how to combine them? And then the other, the other uh, question is, did your teachers develop the discipline, right? They learned science under certain assumptions that this is not history, this is science, right? Or did the teachers learn it in a way that, that Mr. Damasio is saying we need a new model? And what he's saying is we do need to integrate all these disciplines as much as possible. So, He's saying that if you want to have a physically, psychological, healthy psyche from a science point of view and a social science, psychology point of view, you have to also learn to respect laws, the rule of law, culture, ethics, even theology, right? All these disciplines that were considered either anti-science or completely unrelated to science, he's saying, no, no, they really do fit together in a body of neural mapping. <laughs> we have this huge map that we're supposed to get in our heads and train ourselves how to think. Um, let's see, so I refer to Aristotle. Um, let me just... Okay, let me summarize. What I want to do is that I, I'll just list some of the things he said, but then I'm going to give you another uh, way to describe how that might apply, right? What does it really mean? So he, he says, um, when, okay, he himself is an example of the god Apollo. And there are 12 Olympian gods, and they all care about something that's important, 
and they all represent certain kinds of thoughts and certain kinds of energies. So when Mr. Damasio says, we are creatures of culture, in order for us to flourish, we have to follow the golden rule. We have to love each other, literally. He says, we're wired to cooperate. So what he's saying is that it's not true because Muhammad said it, or Jesus said it, or Socrates said it, or Buddha said it, or your mother said it, <laughs> right? It's actually true. Like you're not going to be a healthy species un until you follow the golden rule and you take pleasure in doing that. Well, that's Aristotle. You're generous. You have goodwill for other people. Um, and then he says, you, um, you need to recognize that laws and institutions are really designed for human flourishing, which is, again, what Aristotle said. But he says, it wouldn't have occurred to us but now I'm saying, yeah, they really are tools for homeostasis, which is integrity, balance. He's always talking about balance. And I'm just thinking, hello, <laughs> we've been through this before. Um, so, and then the other concept is balance, homeostasis as opposed to what, right? And um, so his idea of what's off balance, right? What you're not supposed to do is, um, is okay, the way Spinoza works this. Spinoza says this, the outside world uh, provides stimulation, right? And you have this immediate emotional reaction. But you're supposed to develop a clear idea of it. You're supposed to get your self-examination, get your mind thinking. And then you can detach yourself from that passive emotion. That's passive. And then you can start act, being active, right? So then you start choosing your emotions, you start reforming. Uh, you go from emotion to feeling. So you start having a whole range of feelings, but the feelings are chosen. They're emotional reactions, but they're also deliberate emotional reactions, right? Um, so, I mean, you've done this. The thing is students are doing this all the time. And COVID led them to do it even more. So I do want to get to the fact that you're doing this a lot. And I don't know how self-conscious you are about it. But the world, you know, handed you all this stuff. And a lot of the students said, at first, you know, I panicked, I stressed, I was anxious. But then I sort of caught up with myself and my family, and we started to figure out, well, how, what are we going to do, you know, a creative way to respond to this? How are we going to, um, one girl said the family got closer together. Another, you know, a lot of them are saying, right, I got to a higher level of strength of mind and um, self-examination. I started talking to my family members more about what they want in life, about, about their emotions, and, their, and we start changing our emotions so that we develop more mature emotions, right? We don't pick on each other. We love each other. We just stop picking on each other because COVID is so much more important than all that little petty stuff, right? So that whole process is what Damasio says that's what life is about, right? It's not uh, trivial. But literally, if you really took utilitarianism, literally, we're just animals that get the stimuli from outside. 
That's not what it is. And you, if you took Kant, literally, you don't pay any attention you know, to emotions, right? You just, this one emotion, follow the moral law. And he's saying, no, that's not the way the psyche works. So he's saying we have this very complex system of maps. And so we have a lot of emotions. And, but we can process them into feelings. And then our feelings uh, fit. We, the, what we feel matches what reason tells us or would tell us. So where Kant says we should ignore feelings, Damasio says you can't ignore feelings. We're not wired. We're wired. The whole system fits together. And the, you know, the neurons are firing in the electric system and all that. You can't detach them. So Kant is wrong about emotions. Um, so sure, Diana, that's fine. Um, and then on the other hand, when um, the utilitarians teach you to just focus on just on what sort of outside situations are you reacting to, and I have to change my external environment, or I won't change. Like I can't change unless I change the external stimulation. And he's saying, no, that's not true. You can always change the way you, you let's see, feel about what's going on out there. You go from passively reacting to actively deciding what kind of life or what is the wise thing to do. Um, let's see. So one thing he came up with that, that he considered a new idea. So you could tell that in his scientific community, people don't like religion. <laughs> and you can tell because he's saying, on this new model, we can re-examine institutionalized religion. And we can understand it as a way people come together and they show goodwill for each other and they help each other out and they build up these neural maps and they, and they insulate themselves, right? From external constant stimulation that can be threatening. It can mostly be pleasure or fear that distracts you and uh, makes it so you can't think systematically. So you come together in a religious community. There are religious narratives that are teaching you how not to let the outside world get to you and how to love each other, right? So within the, the churches, people show love for each other. And then they start building this neural map that is, um, that is thoughts governing thoughts. And so the highest thought is the thought of God, but he's just saying it doesn't have to be anti-rational. He said, if you're good at making the map, everything you think God wants is according to what reason wants, right? So your God is, speaks in the voice of reason. It's just a personification of what reason would require. So, I mean, a lot of people know that people's ideas of God can be pretty awful. My students at Lyon, God kills innocent people just for fun to test your faith. You know, that Damasio would say, no. I mean, that's why people stopped liking religion and they became humanist was because that really messes with your mind. But all he's saying is that it doesn't have to be. You can unify reason and faith. You can unify wisdom with some kind of religious belief. 
or you can not do it. It doesn't matter. It's just possible. And so what you really want is this system of neural mapping. That's your ultimate goal. Um, what time is it? Oh, it's almost 10. So um, let me go. All right. So here's the, the language he uses is, is reductionistic right? He starts at the very bottom of just the sort of atomistic stimuli coming in. And then he starts building from there. So you have the body state maps are maps that have evolved over a long period of time. Those are the maps that control your nutrition, your digestion, your breathing, your um, all those automatic responses, your circulatory system, all that stuff took years and you know many, many millennia to evolve. And you don't, you know, you can't rewire that. There is a correspondence between the world and your body at that level, because in order for you to actually have survived, these these automatic systems had to have been pretty well fit, pretty well suited, adapted to the world within which you're surviving. But from there, you start, um, there's a higher order, right? You start having feelings. Oh, just wait, my friend just buzzed me, just buzzed, it just arrived and I have to let her in the door just a sec. I should have given you a break, but anyway. So then here's, here's where he says, he says we have mental images. And this is where I really disagree with him in what those mental images are. So the things he refers to are digestion, for example. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, we have a mental image or we know when we're digesting something um, but what I want to you to think about, or what I wanted, what I added to in his book was, um, he says, as we develop these feelings and we think about our feelings, we develop a sense of self. And that's a self that lasts over time, right? And you do that, it's common sense. That's why he's just going step by step. And then he says, um, we can even, what happens then is if you develop this image, you can, what emerges from that as you keep thinking is foresight. So you look ahead, right? So you're imagining yourself, that same self in the future. And again, every well-functioning person does that. So I think all of you, in order to get through each day, I think what you really need to do, of course, is picture yourself, right? You have to keep thinking, what do I want? Well, I want this piece of paper, right? I want to graduate from this school. That's foresight, right? Um, does that make sense to you all that you, and you tie that to emotions. You have, you, you have this emotion to want to get that piece of paper. You picture yourself as a college educated woman. And it's that image that drives you. It's your, it's, but it's thoughts, right? Okay, so let me just ask you these questions to think about, does this make sense? Is this what you're doing? When you falter, right? When you get overwhelmed, you can't see forward anymore. 
important, right? And so you have to step back and figure out how not to be depressed from, how to get over that original panic, right? You're in sort of a survival mode. So all of you have gotten past that. And then you start thinking, but you're also, hopefully, you're not saying, I don't, this is what happened to me when I moved. Let me just shut the door here. Okay, so, so this is um, something I do want you to think about. Um, when I had to move to Lyon College, I had to leave a ninth grader, right, with her dad. And so I just told myself, don't let yourself feel, right? If you feel you're going to cry and you're, you know, you're just, you're going to cry your guts out. You're not going to get your work done. So just don't feel, right? Just get this done. Um, but I think it's much better for all of you not to tell yourself that, right? That's not a very well functioning person. You, what you do is you teach yourself that you feel, right? Uh, this is what I want. This is what is going to make me happy. And every day that I get a little closer to that goal, I have that feeling, right? So um, I think, you know, you, you have to re-envision where you're going and you have to take pleasure in the fact that you're going there. That's where I also think it's really important to have friends encourage each other so you get pleasure out of uh, moving forward and envisioning yourself graduating together, you know, and celebrating and all this stuff. Because then that, then you're going from passive to active and you're getting a mental image in your head of who you are, where you want to go. And you're attaching that to a lot of emotions, uh, feelings, I guess he would call it. And you're literally mapping, you're creating these neural maps that then can start sustaining themselves. They can get to be a habit. So the thing about COVID is that it was this outside stuff that probably broke down a lot of your neural mapping that you had built up. And so you have to rebuild it. Um, but that would be how to do it is not to tell yourself, don't feel. <laughs> it would be, you know, picture, get this image in your head that that is pleasurable, right? And this is really what I want. But I also think talking to other women at AUW and just encouraging others, it you can create a whole climate, a whole culture of women who are overcoming obstacles and encouraging each other and and enjoying life in that way does that make sense to people um does it can you connect that with the reading his you know his this stuff is pretty insufferable in terms of what the heck is he talking about right um but um we're just going to take a break now but this this concept of your ideas about your ideas is what consciousness is or is what your mind is and that's the latest in all this research and i think that's what ancient hindus knew <laughs> and a lot of other people knew a long time ago but that's all right now we have the evidence for it so all right i'll give you um, it's five minutes after, so I'll give you till 20 minutes after. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Yes, yes, Professor. Okay, there's Isabel. All right. All right. Are people back? Um, I hope so. So, um, Let's see, I'm going to um, just sort of read the summary, right? Where, where, um, 
my book goes and where Mr. Damasio, his main points. But what I'll get to after that is in this notion of your imagination, when you're picturing yourself, right? I think it's really important that you have to have an image in your mind of where you want to go, right? So I hope, you know, that all of you have, like there are enough successful women around now that you might have pictured like uh, a woman scientist and you've studied her life story or a woman politician or businessman, there's enough of them around in your countries or in your region that you can identify with some grown up woman who's had her ups and downs and she comes out, you know, and she's a, she is a psychologist or she is a teacher or the way role models, right? Mr. Damasio just doesn't talk about this, but everybody, the average person, this is what they do. And so that, all he's saying is in your neural mapping, you develop an idea of yourself over time, and then you develop these mental images, and then you develop emotions where, you know, you take pleasure in um, detaching your emotions from passive emotions and developing active emotions. Now, the thing, um, the thing I don't like about Damasio is, first of all, he, his idea of the best life is just um, scientific investigation, uh, aesthetic appreciation, appreciation of the arts, um, and love of other people, empathy. Um, but... That, that really is a position of privilege. And he doesn't talk about the differences between men and women when they go through these different stages or the sort of images, the image of a wise old man versus a wise old woman or the images of what a good spouse and parent and career professional would be. Um, and I think it makes it harder for women or for minorities or for people in developing countries if this privileged white guy from the US is saying this in a very generic way. And the, what he's doing and what he describes is him sitting in his office or sitting in his lab and he's creating these drugs and he's the intellectual love of God. His idea of salvation is to think about and do the sciences and, you know, make his contribution to science and appreciation of the arts, like listen to classical music or go to the symphony or something, and then uh, feel empathy toward other people. Well, that's fine. It's just privileged. <laughs> There's a lot of people who have a lot more trouble feeling empathy because they have, they're a lot more dependent on other people and other people can let them down. And so it's harder for them to develop this um, trust, goodwill. It's easy to have goodwill <laughs> when you're sitting, you know, when you're successful, basically, and you don't have a lot of other needs. So um, I don't think he really understands that he has a position of privilege. It, it doesn't mean I disagree with him. It just means that it would be nice if he'd have a more complex and nuanced idea of homeostasis. Um, and then he talks about Everybody seeks a sense of meaning and purpose. And everybody wants to feel this experience of homeostasis, which is integrity, right? So I'm achieving my purpose in life. And I'm getting a lot of pleasure out of that. 
whatever. But um, what I, what, oh yeah, okay. So let me describe how Spinoza does it because there was like a half a page there where I quoted from Spinoza. And he says that pride, um, but he goes through anger, jealousy. He takes that emotion and he says, it's passive and it makes you unhappy because you're reacting. And so then you, if you have a clear idea of your anger, you detach it from the external source and then you figure out how to release yourself from the pride or the anger or the jealousy, you can have this feeling of joy, right? Um, now, it, it's, it seems to me it's more like Kant than Mr. Damasio will admit. Um, but then Mr. Damasio says that he actually prefers Aristotle to Spinoza because Spinoza is too ascetic. He's too detached. So he likes Aristotle and he calls it a well-balanced life, a contented life. Um, and uh, so it's balanced, contented. Anyway, and again, that's a position of privilege. So if you go back over Aristotle's virtues, just to start out with eating, right? You don't eat too much or too little. You eat uh, the protein and the minerals and vitamins that you need, and you eat for the right reason in the right way at the right time. Well, the vast majority of people in this world don't have those kind of choices, right? They don't have access to the right kind of food, or they don't have time to eat it, or they're eating it under some pretty um, seriously, emotionally difficult conditions. Um, and so, you know, it's a position of privilege. Does everybody understand that? And so if he would just admit it, you know, <laughs> that yes, we can make this map. And most people can't achieve it due to circumstances outside of their control. And then they still have to learn how to detach a passive emotion and become active. And so a lot of the students at AUW, when they're writing their, their letter to themselves about how they went through COVID, so many of you had so many things happen that absolutely were not in your control. And so then, but you did learn how to be active. So the truth is, I have a lot more respect for most of the students at AUW than I have for Mr. Damasio. <laughs> Just because he's smart doesn't mean he's wise. Does everybody understand that? I mean, it's true. It's just that, you know, you don't usually hear your teacher saying that. Um, so he might be an authority. He might be good at neuroscience research, but I don't think he's very good at interpreting, you know, what this really means and how to apply it. Um, I think what he did by linking ideas to ideas was very helpful because so many scientists and social scientists don't. So he, I, I, I appreciate that he said, oh, we've gotten beyond that and we have all this evidence. So, so the climate of opinion will change. Um, so that I appreciate that, but those were never arguments I accepted in the first place, but that's okay, everybody else did. Um, but let me just give you a few more examples. Let's see, it's 1030. All right. So the students who had me in the goddesses class last year, this is going to sound familiar. But when he talks about having this imagination um, and this um, mental image 
And from that image, you develop a whole machinery of feeling. What I want to say is that the, the world's mythology, those gods and goddesses and those stories, they are the mental images that were designed to, to inspire people to create the machinery of feeling that he's talking about. So, so that's why I liked the Greek culture better than Spinoza, because Spinoza, his goal was just to be this wise man um, sitting in his house, um, having a, making a map between the world and himself. And Spinoza was discriminated against seriously. He was a Portuguese Jew and the, in the, he was a refugee in the Netherlands and the Dutch people, um, they, were, they were relatively nice to the Jews, but still he was, you know, it wasn't equal. He didn't have equal access to flourish. And he also believed in this God that wasn't the God of the Old Testament. It wasn't the Jewish God. So it wasn't a personal God. It's just God is nature. And so he was marginalized. He was kicked out of, excommunicated from his synagogue. So, so he just basically lived alone. And um, it's okay, you know, but that's not, you know, that's an inadequate model. Then um, Mr. Damasio says Aristotle's model is better, but my claim is all those stories about Greek gods and goddesses, they are all a kind of vaccination Mr. Damasio says that Spinoza's description of these emotions are trying to get you, you think about anger so that when the outside world comes at you and you feel anger right away, you've had, you've been vaccinated against it, <laughs> just like COVID, right? So you've already vaccinated yourself and you won't react. You'll right away identify, oh, that's anger. I'm not going to do that. So um, my claim is that the stories in Greek tragedy and Greek myth are intended to vaccinate you. So you're supposed to identify with those characters and those stories and watch how the this, how this people in the stories destroy everything. And then you're supposed to go, oh, I don't want to do that. And then you go from imagining being in a situation where you're reacting and having this horrible emotion to um, knowing you don't want to do that. And then creating a feeling, creating an image of what kind of person do I want to be? So when you're in the situation, right away you go, nope, not going to do that. I want this, right? And you have it have a feeling right it's not what i want i want to be this and this makes me a lot happier um let's see so um i just i just don't know where to start in terms well that's all right when i had when i taught the the seven greek goddesses at auw the students really liked it okay so let me just Describe each one, and each of you can, I'll describe all seven of them, and I, then I'll call on each of you, and which one do you identify with more, all right? So there was a student who sent me just, just yesterday um, three books, and they're all about Muslim, women Muslim archetypes. So this is just the Muslim version of the same goddesses, right? I haven't read them, so I can't yet teach it. But here are the, the goddesses. One of them is the woods woman, 
the one who loves to be out in nature, the one who loves animals. She tends to be pretty assertive, pretty aggressive, uh, just a physical person. Um, so that's the woods woman. And that's perfectly fine. It's natural, right? It's natural for us to like to be outside, but for some people, it's their number one thing. It's what they really like. And women like that, at this point in history, would be very interested in environmental protection. That might be something they decide they want to dedicate their life to because it fits their archetype. And then there's some women who are Athena. She's the goddess of the public life. Those are the women who run for president. They want to be political leaders or they want to be CEOs. They want to be the president of something and they want to manage. And so even these women, when they are only allowed to have um, wife and mother roles, if they volunteer at their kid's school, you know, the Artemis type will probably take the kids outside. The Athena type might, you know, work with them like high school kids on a student government association and get this, the students to be in clubs and run, you know, teach them management skills. That would be what an Athena would gravitate toward. And then um, Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty is the person who creates, like creates music, um, creates um, textiles or it dresses or um, pottery or whatever, right? They're the artists because they love beauty. Um, and then there's, let's see, one, two, three. Oh, Demeter is the one that, that loves children. She's the mother goddess. And there's some women that that is really what they care about. So when they come to AUW, what they come for is ultimately to be teachers, right? And they're going to go to college to get degrees to go back and teach elementary school or junior high, whatever. Um, and then, okay, Demeter. Oh, there's some women that really want to be married to powerful men. And they want to do volunteer work in the community. They don't want to have to, you know, run things and deal with power themselves. They want to develop a higher quality of life where the guys run the society, but she and her friends whose husbands are powerful, they do the charity balls or they do all sorts of other work that really develops the community. Um, I don't know if little towns have libraries, they would be on the library board, or if they have hospitals, they would be the hospital board. You know, there's volunteer levels of all these organizations. So there's Hera, the wife, Demeter, Aphrodite, Artemis, Athena, Oh, Persephone is the victim. She's the one, the girl who got raped, the girl who got just got hit. And so all of you, during the COVID era, you experienced the archetype Persephone, right? You just felt that you've been hit from the outside and you're a victim, right? But, but you don't have to have a victimization mentality, right? It doesn't have to govern your life. Now, a Persephone who is sort of, that's her archetype, oftentimes is a healer of other people because she's been wounded. She understands wounding. And so she'll go into some kind of therapy or if, the, you know, if there are women who are sort of, um, tarot card readers or something, but they often um, can really help people who are, who have been deeply wounded because they just understand that. And then the last one is Hestia, who is the, the reflective one who basically tries to understand the patterns and how people 
relate to each other and then they try she tries to get them to sit down and talk to each other so they stop doing all sorts of unnecessary uh engage you know she prevents unnecessary suffering so each of these archetypes is a whole image it's a mental image right and then if you decide right you want to eventually um work in an environmental capacity then you have to gauge everything else you do who do i you know what kind of person do i want to be how do i want to live my life following this particular calling um and then the other thing about these archetypes is that human beings have to balance things out and so the stories of the goddesses are stories of when they get so obsessed about what they care about that they ignore the other ones or they do harm to the other ones so for example, Artemis, she, she was a virgin. She's not interested in men. <laughs> she, has a, she just wants to be out with the animals, right? And Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty, yeah, she's interested in men. And so Artemis would really resent Aphrodite and she would get, get at her, hurt her. She, would, she actually killed the the mortal that Aphrodite had a crush on just to sort of get back at her. So there are these nasty things that women do to other women, right? So like a woman who wants to be uh, and have power, be a manager, there might be another woman who just wants to be with children. That's what she likes. And the Athena type will put her down, right? criticize her like but aren't you going to be a feminist i mean you got to go get power to be a feminist i mean why would you want to just take care of kids like that's dated and it's just <laughs> somebody has to be totally passionate about kids right does, does everybody understand this like these are all mental images and they're all about how do you create this image of the life you want that's really fair to all of these complexities of life. So if you want to have a complete life, you have to have ideas about all this stuff and about how to balance it. And so my main claim there is that Mr. Damasio has a very overly simplistic idea <laughs> of what life is about. Does everybody understand that? You can't just sit in your office and contemplate science and the arts and, you know, have goodwill for other people. You have to go down, down there and get down and dirty and make judgments, take action, make choices, relate to people in a lot of different ways, make life difficult so that other people can flourish. If you really want people to flourish, you have to engage at a whole lot of different levels. Um, but anyway, so so that was that's one response I had to him that he's just got it way oversimplified. Then the other thing he says is um, some of the other things. Spinoza and every wise person um, that is not afraid of death, right? They get over the fear of death because death is inevitable, it's natural, and it's really unwise to fear because when older people in a society fear death, they end up using a lot of resources that young people really need okay like if their their bodies are trying to die and they fight it and fight it there's a lot of medical knowledge and energy and money that goes into keeping those people alive that is not there for young babies right and children who also need medical care 
And that's happening in my society. Older people are just sucking up so much money, right? Just to stay alive another year or two. So the fear of death is unwise. It's a passive emotion. Um, Spinoza thought it was irrational. Um, but Mr. Damasio, <laughs> he says, no, no, it's totally natural. Um, and he says, nature is evil because we suffer and we die. It's like, that's not evil, that's nature, right? <laughs> there are cycles. Um, and so there, there was an African myth about this. So again, here's a good example of the way a myth is trying to get you to form your mind in a way that has a good neural mapping. And the story is that at the creation, God gave human beings a choice. Either you can live forever or you can have grandchildren, right? You can't have both. And so obviously that story was told to teach people to accept death because the trade-off is you get to have grandchildren. <laughs> that I think it's great, right? And I think myths are like that. They are very insightful. But then you have someone like Mr. Damasio who doesn't get it. Um, not only that, but he he comes back to say that science um, is much more of a savior of humankind than it really is on his own theory. So he says that science has done so much, you know, to keep, to keep us alive. <laughs> and to fight death, and to fight this evil of nature. And um, I just say, no, that's not true. You know, there are a lot of scientists who are doing that research, but they're doing it because corporations have given them money because that's how corporations make money, selling people all these therapies and drugs. But it's a very unhealthy mental map. Um, but Damasio, he can't see that. So what I want you to understand is that smart people can be blind. They can really not see the big picture. Even when he keeps saying that's the goal, he himself isn't following his own model. All right? So he says nature is cruel because of death, pain, and anguish. Um, and religions have been created to sort of respond to that, which is fine. But um, his, ultimate, his ultimate statement is that he has, well, we all seek meaning and purpose in life. And that's, again, all the myths are based on that. And they're trying to teach you how to seek meaning and purpose in a way that is natural and um, will lead to wisdom. And it will also enable you to contribute to your society. But um, Damasio, his sense of meaning and purpose is to develop these opioid drugs, right? And he said, he wrote this in 2003, and I really do want you to think about this. He said, within 20 years, maybe less. So that's now. <laughs> he said, we will have cured humankind of pain, violence, addiction, and depression, okay? He really says that. Is that true? Did opioids save the world? 
Do you know how many Americans die from opioid overdoses every year? I think it's something like 30,000 or something. I mean, it's huge. Um, so I don't know if the rest of you, if in your country are people dying from opioid addiction or you just don't have access to it so much, that would be the issue. Does anybody know? Anyway, I want at least for you to all tell me, you know, what do you think of that claim that he said right now, 2021, we will almost have solved the problems of pain, addiction, depression, and violence. What do you think, Ashlyn? Professor, I, I don't necessarily agree with that because I can't see any um, change or elimination of pain or sufferings that we are having. So I don't agree with that claim. We still are facing many problems. Like addiction is again a problem in our community like in, during this time. So I don't think there is a change. What about you, Amal? Yeah, same. Like I don't think. Um, we can do that because it's inevitable. Um, like, no matter how we try to eliminate that, there there will be always, you know, pain uh, that, like, you know, we cannot fix. So. so, you know, I started this class with that whole list about unjust suffering, right? And we're sort of back into very similar kinds of questions. Um, but Damasio doesn't have a very sophisticated answer, yet he's highly respected. I mean, the reviews of this book had three Nobel Prize winners, you know, are just raving about this book because this is the way they live, right? They're in a little club <laughs> and they, you know, they think they're going to save the world with science and they like to enjoy the arts and they have goodwill toward people or whatever. And they, and they also think that international institutions like the UN, they're, they're advocating for laws and institutions and the UN and the NGOs, which is fine. Um, it's just that this other side of them that they think science is going to save everything. It's not consistent with the idea that our ideas matter. That's why science won't change everything because ideas matter. Um, okay, I guess I'm gonna ask each of you to give a little feedback at this point um, because you know I'm talking too much and I don't know if I'm making any sense. And I don't like to listen to myself talk. So um, Isabel, do you have any, did you have any reaction to either the reading or what I said? Are you there? Okay, Falak? Mm, yes, Professor. Um, yeah, I don't agree with Damasio uh, because I think that addiction is the major problem these days. So we haven't changed so much. So yeah, I don't agree with him. Um, now, did anything you read? I mean, is there anything in addition you want to say? Mm, no, really, Professor. Okay. Yeah. Fardeen, are you there? Yes, Professor. Uh, yeah, when you were talking about addiction and uh, what Dimazio said about it, I was just thinking that, you know, there are no easy solutions to addiction. Like, it seems like it would have to be a more holistic approach to helping people get over their addictions. Because, yeah, it, it's a much, yeah, it seems like a much more complicated thing, but then... I guess that's where people fall short, like because it has to be a more holistic approach, people just look for short shortcuts a lot of the time. And I don't think that's gonna work. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Fatima, are you there? Jana Tool. Aurora. Yes, Professor. I also didn't agree, but uh, I don't have any additional reactions. Were you surprised at all? Was anybody surprised when I, you know, as you're reading it, you get to the point where he says things like that. Nature is evil because of death or something. No? Uh, okay. Oh, Isabel, are you there? No. Pooja, are you there? Yes, Professor. Okay. Did you have any other reactions? No, no, Professor, not for now. Okay. Well, one thing for sure about your grandpa is that um, this model includes, right, all these layers of social and political life, right? Not just uh, the healer of physical sicknesses, but all the other ways that people uh, develop networks. So uh, all of you have already gotten involved in a lot of networks that are way beyond family or just, just school. I mean, a lot of the students are involved with NGOs or volunteer organizations. They're all making contributions at a social level. Um, a lot of you are in clubs and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so the idea is what, what is it we want to do um, other than just stay physically healthy? Um, let's see. What was I going to say about? Um, oh, yeah, okay. So the, here's what, here's what um, I think Damasio needs to think about. When he worked, when he developed opioids in his lab, he knows the brain chemistry involved, the dopamine and the serotonin. And he talked about that in his book, right? The, the thing is, those scientists should have known how extremely addictive it is. And they should have said, we've got to talk to the politicians and we've got to talk to the corporate folks who make the product. And we've got to tell them they need to regulate who gets it, who's licensed to prescribe it, how much, uh, how much opioid, what the doses should be, what are the criteria for the, the degree of pain people have to be in to get any of it or to get small doses of it? Who's gonna check up to make sure that doctors, who, the people who prescribe it don't get paid higher salaries for prescribing it? Make sure that the corporations that make it don't make a lot more money just selling it without telling people, without telling those licensed to prescribe it how addictive it is. This is common sense. Does everybody understand this? They should have been out there on every advisory board. They should have been raising the red flag. They should have been you know, all over it. They did nothing. They did nothing. <laughs> and they don't think they're responsible for that. Right? You know, we just developed the product. Wait a sec. You're the one who knows the effect on the body. So you are the ultimate authority. You should be on those boards, right? And what actually happened is the company, Pfizer, do you guys know about this? The Sackler family? They have made billions of bucks on 
the opioid, I can't remember what the name of it is, but, and they knew it was addictive and they still kept selling it. And they put their money in Swiss banks because they figured eventually it's going to get regulated or that, yeah, I mean, they're wicked folks. And um, Mr. Damasio, like he is oblivious. Plus, I don't even think he would take responsibility if somebody said, you should have done that. Does everybody understand this? He's just sitting in his office thinking about how great he is that he made these drugs. They're going to save the world. That is not true. Um, so, so the Zeus and Athena. Athena is the goddess of justice. She would say, Mr. Damasio, <laughs> You are Apollo. You are the god of reason. You are the god of science, math. But you are not the god of justice. Like you must pay attention to this, right? So um, Artemis, the goddess of the wilderness, would say, Mr. Damasio, how much money is being invested in, in what you do, as opposed to green technology, green energy, and helping people stay well, like wellness stuff. Um, herbal, met, herbal, you know, some kind of herbal health and well being, healthy food, right? You're not, you're not talking about maintaining health, you're claiming that when people do get depressed or violent or pain, you can fix them. But you're not saying anything about prevented, preventing, right? And so an Artemis type would really resent the fact that so much money goes into what Damasio does and no money goes into this other stuff. Okay, then there's um, Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty, and when she's off kilter, um, there are people who are self-indulgent, right? They think I should be able to experience pleasure the way I want as long as I don't hurt somebody else, right? So they would advocate for recre recreational opioids. Does that make sense? I mean, low doses, right? Re maybe really low doses so you don't get addicted. But there's going to be people advocating for that. You could have predicted that. And then you ask Mr. Damasio, well, what do you, based on what you know, would you recommend that this, these things would ever be over the counter, recreational? And if not, you better speak out, right? Because <laughs> there are going to be people and they're going to go to corporations and they're going to be people who are greedy and they're going to try to get these other people to advocate to the politicians and you're the you're the one who knows right are you going to cut this off and say no never recreational because if you don't say it this is what's going to happen all right and then um, what do we got? Artemis, Athena, Aphrodite, Persephone would say, you're going to make so many victims, right? People are going to, these opioids are going to rewire the brain so badly that it's going to be really, really hard to go through this exact process that you keep talking about, right? because those shots of do dopamine have changed the brain chemistry. And so it's really hard for people to ignore it, not want anymore, right? And turn toward, you know, these active um, emotions and the much more um, intellectual kind of pleasures, pleasures tied to reason. <laughs> Mr. Damasio, your opioids are a major reason why it will be much more difficult for people to do that. So you're basically making victims when you think you're saving people. 
Um, okay. Um, Hera. Oh, yeah. Hera is the goddess of honor. So, Mr. Damasio, the neuroscientists are profoundly honored by so many academics, so many doctors. They just get a lot of public honor and status because they're going to, you know, save the world. They're going to rewire our brains for us or whatever. And, you know, somebody else will say, no, even on your own view, the people who really deserve honor would be the therapists who talk to patients and who try to get them to rethink their lives. And also a lot of therapy is family therapy because somebody is depressed or addicted uh, some of the addiction is body chemistry, but some of the pain, the addiction, the depression, and the violence are a function of the relationships, the family dynamic at home. So on your view that thoughts cause thoughts and you can rewire your brain, that's what a family therapist does. They work with families to try and get get them to relate differently. This is not the black sheep of the family. You know, you're making this person depressed and it's a lot harder for them to get out of the depression as long as you keep labeling them, you know, the black sheep. So a family therapist job is to, is to re get people to rethink um, and then start to relate to each other differently and then maybe get the person out of that situation so they don't keep falling back. But Damasio doesn't, that isn't where the honor goes in our society. The money and the honor and the status go to the pill, not to the people who are trying to get people to rethink their lives. Um, Herod Demeter. Um, the mother. Um, all right, so of course, people who's, oh, there's a movie, Ben is back, about a woman whose son got addicted to opioids. And um, she happened to run into the doctor that had prescribed them and told her no problem. And he was sort of getting old and, and she just wanted to kill him. Right. And I understand that totally. <laughs> but um, but in terms of Demeter, Demeter would just feel helpless in the face of these neuroscientists who think they're so important. And then they watch how their own children get completely damaged by this. And they they can't do anything. They don't have status. Um, they don't have the respect that the neuroscientist has. Um, so anyway, I just, I just hope you can understand that smart people can get trained. They get specialized. They get trained into one thing and they get very narrow and they really can't understand the human condition. They can't understand the legitimate passions other people have, the need to balance them, the complexity of life, and then um, the fact that nobody is going to save anybody. Everybody just has to work together. Um, so that's kind of where I want to go with Mr. Damasio. Um, and so it's, yeah, I'm going to let you go early because I really don't like listening to myself talk. Um, I hope that by next time um, you'll be able to read it. I'm wondering, those of you who read the first chapter, did you think it was hard to read or did you think it was easier to read than other stuff?
uh, for me, it's easy, I guess, professor. Uh, yes, it's easier. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's Yes, professor, it's easier. Okay, so the hardest part was chapter two when I'm quoting him, right? Do you notice that whenever I quote him, it's just like, uh, uh. <laughs> yes, Professor, okay. so many goals. I did because I wanted to be fair, you know, it's important to be fair. Um, but I think the rest of it is not him anymore. Um, the, the thing that might make it difficult is just that it's complicated. So when I write, I list all these different gods and goddesses. It's just complicated. And so in your head, you've got to sort of, oh, there's that and that and that. So I don't think the difficulty is in the sentences so much. It's in what they refer to. Um, so the, but the next chapter, what am I giving you? Chapters eight and nine or something? And... I yeah, just, eight and nine. Okay, well, let me just see what that what that is. Um, and then I can I'll just give you a little heads up about it. Um, okay, so it, number eight is just in general what the Greeks are trying to do and why I advocate them. So let me talk about that a little bit before I let you go. Um, and the thing, I really want you to, um, to know that if I had studied Hinduism, if that had been my career, I'm sure I would have found the same things or Buddhism or, or Islam. So this is not unique to the Greeks. It was what I had a teacher who was passionate about this and the discipline of philosophy. Um, this is the Greeks are the only are the only major ancient wisdom point of view that's allowed into philosophy programs because all the they just take off and they're mostly all in the Enlightenment or related to the Enlightenment. Um, but most of my students have grown up with some more ancient tradition. And that's usually called religion and philosophers have nothing to do with religion and it's just crazy. But the, my main point is that I do think those of you who know these other traditions well should be able to see that, well, yeah, it isn't just the Greeks. I know that. <laughs> but I thought, I'll, you know, it's so complicated. There's so many dimensions that, that all I'm going to be able to do with my life is do one. And then my students can feel free to do, to, to take it further. And then I can learn from them, right? I just absolutely, there's not enough energy for me to go into depth on all of them. But that's why I like to have students who know more than I do. Um, so the chapter eight is just a summary of the Greek culture as a whole. So when people would go to these tragedies and they would watch somebody living out some sort of irrational fantasy that I don't know about you, but, but I've had some of these, right? Has anybody in this room ever gotten hurt by another person and had revenge fantasies? You want to get back at them? No, oh, you guys are perfect, aren't you? <laughs> well, you know, I can't remember when I was 20, but it, I mean, it gets worse. This is the problem, right? You get more heavily invested. You don't necessarily grow up on any of this stuff, okay? So, you have this play about somebody who actually lived out that fantasy and it's so destructive. So then you go, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to do that. And you get in that habit of not letting yourself even fantasize about it because you know, you've been through that in your head, you know, the play, you know, you can, you can process it because then you have a lot more energy to do positive things. 
So when you think about your relationships with the AUW sisters, right? You have to think about how much time do you spend on negative things, right? Um, and it, it's, I know that a lot of you have so much stuff coming at you. And, but on the other hand, like physiologically, I think you'd be better off if you found some way to do something creative and positive, right? Because it just keeps reinforcing <laughs> the, all the stuff you have to do or all the obstacles that you have. Um, so that's what tragedy tries to do. It tries to, okay, the human condition is difficult. It's not, you haven't been picked out for punishment. Um, you can have these fantasies, but they're not going to go anywhere. You don't really want to do that. So then you have, you're released to be a lot more creative. And Damasio talks about, you know, joyful emotions, but it's way too oversimplified. He has this, well, then you follow the golden rule and you follow the rule of law. Well, that's nice. What if the laws are unjust, you know? And which usually happens with virtuous people is they get in trouble because they call out corruption. Um, and Damasio never mentions that. Um, he never mentions another thing, which is human beings usually don't go around saying, oh, yeah, I just like to kill people. Or they usually say, I really want to follow the golden rule, but these other people are after me, right? They're, I have to protect myself. I have to protect my family. Right, I don't want to violate the golden rule, but right, I'm in this situation. That's what most people, how they get stuck. Does everybody understand that? It's way too simplistic to say, follow the golden rule and everything will turn out fine. And so the Greek, the Greeks give you a very complicated, nuanced worldview. And they say, this is, the, this is the world against which you have to make decisions. And don't oversimplify it. And um, it's day by day. Um, and then chapter nine is where he, he talks about how the drugs will save the world. And then I just played out, you know, spelled out pretty much what I just said about all the different layers of problems and questions that he never did address. So that's, that's pretty much it. And we're a whole hour early, but I, I don't mind. I hope that it hasn't been too boring. I just can't tell at all when it's just me. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, I have caught up pretty well. About two days ago, I checked, I wrote my list, you know, of how many um, posts had come in. And I had gotten up to number 14, and I only had two left. So probably a lot of you might have posted since then. But I do want you to know I'm trying to keep up. Um, and sometimes I haven't written as many comments as I might have because I just want to make sure, right? I can keep up to some extent and you know how you're doing. But um, let's see. Yeah, I won't have office hours for, I have the next three days I have classes, so it'll be a while. Okay. Any other questions? Um, all right, so 